Carla, you spoke about Condoleezza Rice. Well, yesterday I spoke with her also. Condoleezza Rice, a Californian and former Secretary of State under George W. Bush, her passionate speech was one of the highlights here. And on a personal note, a little girl grows up in Jim Crow, Birmingham, the segregated city of the South where her parents can't take her to a movie theater or to a restaurant. But they have her absolutely convinced that even if she can't have a hamburger at the Woolworths lunch counter, she could be president of the United States if she wanted to be, and she becomes the Secretary of State. First of all, welcome to the program. Thank you. Yeah. You know, in your speech, you said the question of the hour is, where does America stand? And in a recent op-ed piece, you questioned whether re-engagement with Baghdad was uh, something that we, the country should be concentrating on. Yes. Do you think that uh, troops should be sent back into Iraq? Oh, I absolutely do not think we need to send troops back to Iraq. We have done our job in Iraq in the military sense. But I really mean uh, engagement uh, diplomatically, engagement through uh, the economy, engagement with the people of Iraq, because Iraq has very troublesome neighbors. And so a successful Iraq has the potential to change the face of the Middle East. And so our engagement should be deep, but it should be political, diplomatic, social, economic. How do you think the rise of China uh, will or does have an effect on the economic health, say, of California? Well, certainly the rise of China as an economic power is uh, one of the major stories of the uh, late 20th and early 21st century. Uh, I was in China in 1988 in Beijing, and the streets of Beijing were a competition between a few horse carts, a few automobiles, and a lot of bicycles. That's not the China of today. It's uh, been an economic miracle. Um, but China, it, it can be an economic miracle that is good for the international economy. We uh, should be able to uh, have the Chinese have freer trade so that we can get our exports uh, into China. We need robust Chinese economic growth to help fuel the international economy. Uh, but we also need China to play by the rules, and that's the hard part. But a free and fair relationship with China certainly benefits the American China's economy. Moving vigorously across the world, yes. signing agreements with nations in Africa yes. and South America. What do you make of all of that? Well, the Chinese are doing really what we should be doing, which is that they are pressing very hard to find free trading partners across the world. That's how you build the uh, environment for your own exports and stimulating your own economy. So we need a much more robust trade agenda. Uh, rather than criticizing the Chinese for uh, taking advantages of the possibilities of free trade. The question of immigration is a high one throughout this, and has been throughout this whole election season. Um, you didn't receive an awful lot of applause when you made your comment about uh, a humane immigration policy. What do you advocate, and do you think that the party uh, w is in line with your thoughts? Well, we really do have to have comprehensive immigration reform. And we have to have it for three great reasons, three great uh, important reasons. Number one, we do need to secure our borders. And that is something that I think everybody agrees on. Uh, secondly, we all know that this is an economic benefit. Uh, immigration uh, brings people uh, who need to make $5, not 50 cents, and agriculture is dependent uh, on those people. We also know that at the so-called high end, uh, in places like uh, Silicon Valley, uh, across the, the bay in uh, Berkeley, we know that uh, people are coming here as engineers and scientists, and they're helping to fuel that uh, knowledge-based revolution that, indeed, California is leading. And so we need uh, the economic benefits of immigration. But more than anything, we are a nation of immigrants. And and after the election, I hope that as a country, the president and the Congress together will undertake immigration reform, because it's something that we have to do at the federal level. The states really can't have their own immigration policies. You were quite emotional when you spoke about education. You said that the failure of educating minority and poor students from K to 12 was threatening the very fabric of our society, and you called it a civil rights issue. Absolutely. It is a civil rights issue, because you cannot take advantage of the benefits of being American 
uh, whether you came here from another place or were born here, if you do not have a quality education. And I think it's especially a civil rights issue for the poorest kids who are trapped in the worst schools. The truth is, people opt out of bad schools uh, if they have the means. They send their kids to private schools, or maybe they go to a district where the schools are good. And the people who are trapped there are the poorest. That is the height of inequality. We're at a time now, in a season, particularly in the state uh, here of Florida and other key swing states where voting rights are being challenged. What's your feeling? What's your reaction? Well, I understand that people want to make sure that there's no voter fraud. I understand that. Um, I also understand um, the argument that uh, there ought to be some way of proving that you are uh, a voter and that you, uh, through an ID of some kind. Let's give people time to do that. Uh, let's make it easy to get identification. I don't uh, like very much the argument that somehow minorities uh, can't get an ID. That seems to infantilize to me, frankly, minorities. Uh, we, we, can, we can do this. But people have to be given time. We have to find a way to make it uh, easy. The states are reacting because the federal government has not. And uh, we, we do need to solve this problem. But let's give people time and let's do it in a way that doesn't, uh, doesn't make it difficult for people to exercise their franchise. Finally, the question of women in the party. Yes and their role in yes. the party yes. and the reputation the party has built over some remarks made here and there that there's a war against women going on. Yes, there's no war against women. This is, this is really, this is hyperbole of the worst sort. Uh, we shouldn't caricature each other in this way. Uh, there are people who have strong beliefs um, about uh, issues of, uh, of abortion, uh, about life, about choice, strong issues. Let's respect each other. This is a party that has a lot of powerful and strong women within it, and uh, many of them uh, who have views that may be different than my own. But we respect each other. I feel welcome in this party, and I think it's time to stop this uh, caricature and hyperbole. Well, I think I'd be punished if I didn't ask you about Augusta, <laughs> the National Golf club that you broke another barrier. D d had you applied? Did they come after you or what happened? No, I, it was really quite a surprise, kind of out of the blue. Augusta is a private club and so they have their own processes. Uh, but I was honored uh, to be asked to, to join Augusta. Um, as I said some time ago, it's a, it's a private club, but we all know that the face of America, the face of uh, everything is changing. And so it was, it was obvious that the face of golf was going to change too. Um, I am uh, honored to be there. Augusta does a lot of good work with uh, growing the game among youth. Uh, that's something that I would like to see because I'd like to see a broadening of the base of people uh, who play golf in terms of color and gender. Uh, but mostly I'm really looking forward to trying to improve my short game so that I can play Augusta well. Dr. Rice, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you.